Since the dawn of the 21st century, scientific discovery has rushed forward at lightning speed. Genetics, physics, computerized technology, robotics, virtual reality. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert as they uncover the truths behind this ultimate scientific deception. Welcome to Sci Friday. Manners maketh man. Do you know what that means? <laughs> it means it's time for Sci Friday on Skywatch TV. Welcome. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining me in studio, my best friend, our science advisor, and the author of the Red Wing Saga, Sharon K. Gilbert. Hi, Hi sweetie. sweetie. How are you? I'm doing Welcome fine. Welcome back to the set. Welcome back to the States. Yes, indeed. We had such a good time. And by the way, that opening quote is from King's Man. Yes. King's Man, a wonderful film. Uh, two of the many films we got to see when we were on the international flights, which thankfully make the flights go a lot faster than they, than they actually do. Seem I'm, faster yeah. than oh, they actually do. They did yeah. seem to fly by, and then literally. Yeah. Ten I mean, and a half hour flights, not something I want to do on a regular long basis. Long flights, yeah. not, yeah, I agree with that. But that, if you have not seen King's Man or King's Men, uh, we saw a, an edited version, so it was uh, the, the little bit language, of flow, yeah. uh, foul language that was in there was uh, dubbed. It was a, honestly, it doesn't need the movie was so, so incredibly good. The plots were very clever. It's based on a, a comic book, I right, understand. Right. So we watched two movies and, and we're ready for a third. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess there fun. isn't one yet. Colin mm -hmm. Firth was excellent as uh, Agent Galahad. It's a secret service agency that uh, was uh, set up uh, as an independent agency. It's and like something out of the Red Wing saga, actually, in a way. So if you've right. not read all the way through book three, books three and four, you may not know what I'm talking yes. about, but it's the ICI. But Far be it from us to uh, convey the sense that that was the most interesting thing that happened to us over the last three weeks. Hardly. That was just yeah. uh, one of the fun things on our flight back. We have had an incredible three weeks. We appreciate the fact that you guys have said you missed us. <laughs> But at the same time, we missed you. But yes, while yeah. we were missing you, we got to be in Israel, in Jordan, in uh, Italy for a little while, and in Sardinia, mm -hmm. which is part of Italy. An incredible journey of archaeological sites. Yeah. W what's interesting, and I think a lot of people might be surprised to hear this, but for me, um, of the places that we saw, and again, we spent about you know, five days in Israel, uh, a couple of days in Jordan, several days in Rome, and then, uh, what, five days, more or less, in, in Sardinia. Mm -hmm. um, not nearly long enough. Not Should have been there enough. 15 days. Right. Um, I, I could, you know, Rome was interesting, and I, I don't want to take anything away from what we saw. I mean, seeing the uh, the Roman construction of the Colosseum, mm -hmm. seeing the Sistine Chapel was, uh, you know, once-in-a-lifetime thing. But to be honest with you, that, of all of the places we saw, it was probably... My, my least favorite part of the tour. And it's I, not to say that it was bad, it's just it was my least favorite. I, I thoroughly enjoyed Israel, Jordan, and Sardinia. Rome was um, beautiful. I enjoyed walking through the streets, and I enjoyed wa more than mm -hmm. I enjoyed walking through the Vatican Museum. Yes, yeah, so did I. The Vatican Museum, the day we and were told that it's this way almost all the time, mm -hmm. it literally was like sardines moving along right. one tiny, tiny step at a time, an inch at a time. At one point, it, I realized we're only halfway through the tour. At, from here on out, it's matter. It's just a matter of attrition. Who's going to still be standing by the time we get? Because <laughs> it was warm, it was crowded. And it was it, three yeah. hours of doing that. Right, right. Um, now, walking through the streets and seeing the little cafes and shops in, in Rome, that was wonderful. That was beautiful. But my favorite part of the Rome-Sardinia section of the tour, uh, the True Legends expedition, were the archaeological sites on Sardinia. Oh, those were incredible, incredible. And we so want to go back to those. Yes. We have, by the way, there is a, a travel log of sorts, a mm -hmm. mini documentary that's going to be coming out with your book. Yes, yes. Uh, coming in August. There are three books that are coming, from um, w one from me and then uh, one from Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, mm -hmm. and then Carl Gallops has a new book coming out. So I am honored that mine will be part of that, uh, that trio of books coming from Defender Publishing in August, and you'll see uh, programs about those in August on Skywatch TV. But um, we will have a uh, travelogue that we'll be putting together in the next week or two of all of the video and uh, images that we took. And the sites that we saw in Israel were, inc were incredible because we, we saw some of the, the sites that everybody needs to see. We went to the Mount of Olives. We saw the Temple Mount. We didn't get on the Temple Mount. That's kind of restricted. Mm -hmm. 
but we were able to look down onto the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. Which we is, were underneath the Temple we Mount. We did, however, go underneath the Temple Mount through the, the Western Wall tunnels. So we got right up to the Western Wall underground, mm -hmm. which is incredible because some of those stones on the foundation of the... I didn't know they were that big. They're gigantic, 70 feet, five feet long, four feet deep, right. very tall, like 10 feet tall, very massive stones that were put there by Herod. Right, and when we hear of megalithic stones and megalithic construction, we hear about Baalbek, we hear about uh, Machu Picchu and uh, you know, uh, Angkor Wat and things mm -hmm. like that. But what Herod moved in the first century BC to construct the his, his renovations and additions to the Second Temple. And the Western Wall was essentially the retaining wall that allowed him to extend out the plateau right. of um, the Temple Mount. Which he Those was famous were, for doing. He right, loved to put right. a big foundation, sort of like here's a, a base to make this, this uh, uh, building shine. Right. Um, he liked architecture that demonstrated that he, Herod, was master of nature yeah. rather than trying to integrate his designs into nature. Uh, we saw that That's at Masada to put it. also, uh, because he had uh, several palaces constructed, uh, two or three palaces at Masada. I, you know, if there was a I third, there I never two, saw I it. We two. saw two. Right. And there were the same sorts, as it was the same sort of approach there at Masada that he uh, set up as sort of a refuge around the same time he was building the Temple uh, Mount and the Temple in, uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. But uh, gosh, yeah, those stones at the base of the Western Wall are immense, and I've never heard anyone talk about them before. It surprises me because we've been following this kind of weird sort of, you know, cyclopean architecture for a long time. I I know. And speaking of cyclopean architecture, when we were um, in Sardinia, we're and again, when you get to see the DVD when you order the package this fall, you will see what we're talking about. Um, there are neurogic towers mm -hmm. in Sardinia, lots and lots and lots of them, something like 30,000 or more, and we only got to see a few of them. Right. But it's clear from um, what we observed and also what Anselm P. Rambla uh, to, uh, determined based on what he saw, he was with us, by the way, mm -hmm. um, that it's clear that these sites are aligned with the stars. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't even remember I had this app on my phone, but I've got a compass app. On my phone. It came out. It came handy. It, it came in it handy. Came it's in the handy. first time I'd ever had to use it. I haven't used a compass since I was a Boy Scout, but it was neat being able to go onto these sites and look and say, "Well, well look at that. This one is aligned <laughs> north south, just like the other ones." Uh huh. But the, um, the, the to me the most impressive site, the Naraji Towers, and, and Naraji is just a uh, name that archaeologists have given to that culture. We don't know what they called themselves right. because we've not found, scholars haven't found any examples of their writing yet. So Naraji are the individual towers. Naragic is the civilization. Um, the, these towers with these huge stone blocks, um, scholars still argue about what those towers are for. But the ziggurat that we saw at Monte de Cody mm -hmm. was incredible because it looks for all the world like a Mesopotamian style uh, ziggurat, a step pyramid, and scholars agree on that point. The neurogic civilization, um, according to scholars' estimates, is roughly the, the same time frame as, say, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, from, from Abraham until about the conquest of Canaan. So mm -hmm. about 1800 B.C. roughly to about 1200 B.C. This, this ziggurat, I, I read one scholarly paper that uh, estimated the, uh, the earliest construction at 3200 B.C., but yesterday um, a, uh, a friend on Facebook, uh, Jeffrey, thank you for sending the link to that, sent me another paper by a peer-reviewed, you know, another peer-reviewed paper, secular scholar, that put, based on radio, uh, uh, radio, radio carbon dating, yeah, oh, ca yes. carbon, carbon uh, dating, the earliest construction to about 3900 BC. Oh. So we're talking not long after what would have been the flood. Almost immediately after. Yeah. One of the first sites set up after Babel was it, destroyed. Exactly, exactly. Um, so even 3200 B.C. would have been not long after Babel, but 3900 B.C. might have even predated Babel. We, yeah. we don't know for sure. We don't know. Probably, probably not long after Babel. But this site was then in use, according to scholars, until about the time of the Neurogic civilization. So we're saying this site was in use as a religious shrine for over 2,000 years by the time Abraham was mm -hmm. on the scene. So why Sardinia for this type of uh, the step pyramid, which we thought was 
basically only found in Mesopotamia. It's oh, the I, only one in the Western Mediterranean. I had never heard of any of this until we talked with uh, Timothy Alberino mm -hmm. uh, last year, I think it was. Right, and, right. And so I was so glad when he and, and Steve Quayle invited us to go with them this time around. Uh, Steve Quayle didn't get to go, sadly, but he sent his son. Yeah. And uh, uh, there, there was a family emergency that Steve stayed home for, and good on him for doing that. But uh, we had an incredible time, and that ziggurat was surprising in many ways. And one of the reasons it surprised you is because you had been looking for the sort of trilithon mm -hmm. construction that uh, we see in the... Um, dolmens. In the, the dolmens, exactly, that you see in the Rift Valley area, in the tra Valley of the Travelers. Mm -hmm. But we saw it there. Yeah, the Jordan Rift Valley, the Jordan River, uh, the east side of that river is where the Bible tells us the Rephaim tribes lived. In the days of Abraham, um, the kings from the east, the king of Elam and his colleagues traveled to the Levant uh, and uh, traveled down the King's Highway, the east side of the Jordan River, and did battle with the Rephaim tribes in Bashan and then in what later became um, the lands of Ammon, Moab, and Edom before fighting the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, and their allies. So, th the, and that's where you find these, these megalithic tombs two slabs, vertical slabs, and then a capstone on top. And there are 25,000 of those in the Jordan Rift Valley, more than anywhere on Earth, except for Korea for some reason. That's odd. Yeah, mm -hmm. you find them elsewhere. There are some in the Caucasus Mountains, there are some in Ireland and Scotland, but mainly in the Rift Valley, and they date to about that same period of time as that uh, ziggurat on Sardinia, from about 3200 B.C. down to about the time of Abraham, about 1800 B.C. Well, when we were walking around, uh, Timothy Alberino originally thought that it was a, an altar of some kind, and, and some that's scholars, what we all thought, right. and some scholars think that. And then you and I looked at a photograph from a different angle that we'd take, one of us had taken, and we both went, oh. That's a, that looks like a dolmen, and then sure enough, the academic paper that I read about Monte de Cote said, oh no, that's a, that's a dolmen. And we went to another site um, the following day, which was one of the Tombs of Giants. And there are a number of sites on Sardinia that are called Tombs of Giants. Yeah. Sounds like hyperbole, but they even have it on little signs there from the archaeological division of archaeology or whatever from the island of Sardinia, the government there. Tombs, Tumba mm -hmm. de Gigantes. Gigantes. Yeah. yeah. And behind the, uh, this Tomb of the Giant, was, lo and behold, you know, hey, look, about 25 feet over there on the other side of this barbed wire fence, there's another dolmen. Yes. And it turns out, and I found a book, it's in Italian, unfortunately, so I'm going to have to struggle a little bit with Google Translate to read it, but there are a couple hundred of those dolmens in the Trilithon construction on the island of Sardinia, and most of them in the northern half of the island for some reason. I don't it's know really they, interesting. So the point, I guess, is th there are similarities, cultural and architectural similarities between Mesopotamia and these um, structures that, uh, biblically speaking, are in the same place and at the, built at the same time as the Rephaim tribes uh, who occupied the Jordan River Valley, found on the island of Sardinia and identified with places that the locals have for a couple thousand years identified with giants. So it's, it sounds like hyperbole when you first hear it, but when you go there and look at those stones. You're standing inside this tower that's 40 or 50 feet tall, surrounded by stones that weigh as much as your car. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to ignore the evidence. And another thing that we saw over and over again that Tim had told us about was that uh, there seems to be evidence of some sort of catastrophic flood. Right. Not just Noah's flood, but something beyond that that some, overtook right. the island. You and I, over and over again, including the ziggurat, we saw seashells. Right. And in fact, we were up on top of this very high pyramidal shaped mountain yes. at, at Eleonora's castle. And it's, it was a long climb. And you and I, we struggled to get up there, but we made it. But once we got up there, sure enough, seashells. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Eleanor of, uh, of Arborea was a uh, famous Sardinian uh, queen who ruled the island. Pretty much the whole island. Yeah, back in the 14th century AD. But, uh, right, she built a castle, a, a number of them around the island for control, but this one was on top of And the of mountain peak. looks like it is a pyramid it, that's it covered in vegetation. Yeah, it, 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 it absolutely does. And as you pointed out, seashells on top of this, this point, a very high point on this mountainous island. So, um, yeah, scholars believe something might have happened in the 16th century B.C., um, uh, a, a meteor or meteorite or something that hit in the ocean some, or somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea. 
south of the island that m maybe washed stuff up, up over Sardinia. Mm -hmm. um, of course, that was not too long after, if I remember correctly, the uh, volcano uh, Santorini on the Greek island of Santorini. That's Blue. possible, and depending upon when it actually did happen, there's also the 536 AD event that we've talked about on Sci Friday before, mm -hmm. where something may have hit in the Atlantic Ocean and caused 10 years of reduced solar activity so that crops failed. Right, right. So anyway, just just a fascinating thing, and this will probably lead to another book, because uh, I, I can see why Tim was so excited about getting the True Legends expedition there to the island of Sardinia. Mm -hmm. Seeing these sites, seeing the the sacred wells dedicated to the goddess Tanit. Yes, um, who and we need to talk more about oh, her, but right, we need right, to take right. a break first. We do, we do. Well, uh, we'll talk about why this is significant, how it relates to the Phoenicians and child sacrifice, which is why my interest, because it relates to mm -hmm. my forthcoming book, when Sci Friday continues after this. Call now and get Reverend Donna Howell and Special Investigator Allie Hinson's brand new eye-opening book, Dark Covenant, along with a never-before-released four-part Dark Covenant companion DVD and Occultianity, how the end times church is forming now in preparation of Antichrist on DVD. This is an exclusive offer for our Skywatch television audience. Yours for a donation of $35 plus shipping and handling. In the new book, Dark Covenant, you will learn how the church is being groomed to embrace the unthinkable in preparation for the enforcement of the mark of the beast. How the true body of Christ is being slowly positioned to be considered a public enemy, with the Bible labeled as hate speech and possibly soon prohibited. Why much of the church has been lulled into slumber over the preceding decades and is unprepared to be a force for good in our troubled world. How much of Western Christianity has actually become a cult and what the true body of Christ can do to survive the modern assault on Christianity. You'll also receive the Dark Covenant Companion DVD. Join Reverend Donna Howell, Allie Hinson, and the Skywatch investigative team for this original four-part series on DVD. This eye-opening expose is already sending shockwaves through the Western religious establishment and is certain to help ready the true remnant of God with the tools needed to navigate the coming days of persecution. But that's not all. In this must-have collection, you'll also receive Occultianity, how the end times church is forming now in preparation of Antichrist. In this exclusive never-before-released DVD, Donna Howell and Allie Hinson walk you step-by-step -step through the well-laid plans of an occult oligarchy who are, as we speak, advancing the way for the system of Antichrist, all while a silent, complacent church has forgotten the true power of the body of Christ and are inadvertently laying the foundation for the bloodiest cult the world has ever seen. This DVD alone is a last day's warning that all true believers must have that will equip God's anointed with the knowledge and power they need to set people free from the powers of deception. Sold separately, these items hold a retail value of more than $75. Yours now for your donation of only $35 plus shipping and handling while supplies last. Prepare for the coming days of religious fallout as a ready soldier for the coming true Messiah. The Dark Covenant special offer available now at Sky iWatchTVStore.com. Order now or call 1 844 750 4985. In Strauss and Howe's The Fourth Turning Vision, a deal with the devil ultimately includes the arrival of an unexpected national leader who would emerge during the current fourth turning. Now this guy would come from an older generation and he would lead the globe into a new world order, which they envisioned developing by the year 2025. By offering to build back better, a socialist governance with welfare for the masses. This leadership they saw would seize what could only be described as a cancel culture crusade, warm to promulgating Oceania-like suppression of unapproved dialogue in order to rein in any and all challenges to the new social construct. RISE 2021, a virtual conference with 50 hours of world-class presentations on theology, prophecy, archaeology, geopolitics. Sign up now at DefenderConference.com. 
Welcome back to Sci Friday from Skywatch TV. Very quickly, I want to tell you again that the, uh, the, the Sharon's new book, the fourth novel in the Red Wing saga, is out and available. It, it's available at Amazon, but we are going to have it here in the studio in right. a couple of weeks. Uh, I haven't gotten the exact ETA, but it will be here soon, and you'll soon, probably next week, we'll tell you about the offer, and it's going to have some. You know how Tom Horn is; he always throws in free stuff. Mm -hmm. He's going to be throwing in free stuff yet again. So. Get ready for that. Um, for those of you who've let me know that you read the book already, Realms of Stone, and you loved it, thank you. I'm really glad because I loved writing it. Book five is going to be even more fun. In mm -hmm. fact, Sardinia yes. got me thinking about a future plot. Well, yeah, volcanic glass and uh, obsidian mm -hmm. found mm -hmm. on, uh, on that island. And many um, other things about that island. But also, you and I found Tophets. Right, right. Um, this is uh, something connected to the Phoenicians and their practice of sacrificing children to the god Baal Hemon, known from classical historians from Greece who, and from Rome, who pointed out that at Carthage they had a practice of sacrificing children to the god Baal Hemon, who they equated with Saturn and Kronos. Kronos, of course, king of the Titans. In my book, I explain why he is to be also equated with El, chief god of the Canaanites, or Mount Hermon. Uh, where the Watchers came down. In other words, Baal, Haman, Kronos, Saturn, El, Dagon, mm -hmm. Dagon of the Philistines, mm -hmm. all the same entity just by different names. The god who led, or the fallen angel rather, who led these rebels against their creator and are now in Tartarus, in chains in gloomy darkness until the judgment. They are still being worshipped. and They were still being worshipped well into the Christian era. And the Greeks and Romans knew it. The Carthaginians, the descendants of the Phoenicians, descendants of the Amorites, who God said in the time of Abraham, their iniquity is not yet complete. Uh, this continued on for a long time. Like the sacrifices to Molech at the, top, the Tophet at Jerusalem, uh, the Carthaginians did it in uh, what is now Tunisia. Mm -hmm. It was also done at a site uh, called Matia on Sicily and at Taros, probably other sites as well, but the one we saw was at Taros mm -hmm. on um, the west coast of Sardinia. They would sacrifice newborns, infants, burn them, and bury them in urns. Uh, and and the, the experts are still debating back and forth whether right. or not these sacrifices took place every month or, or just several times a year. Right. But it's generally understood that, indeed, at least occasionally there were sacrifices that took place. Right. Um, I, I found a 19th century uh, British archaeological uh, society paper from a Reverend Kara, I think his name was. He had been there in 1851 at the same time as Lord, uh, can't think of the last name, but as someone who's well known as being an archaeologist archeolo in that region. And this uh, Reverend not only looked at the Tophet there, mm -hmm. but he looked at the layout of the buildings that the, that the locals lived in, those who were helping to build things and who worshipped at that site. And they were in an amphitheater construction, and he said in the middle was an altar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Taros is, uh, in, in fact, th this is something else that was very exciting. Based on evidence found by scholars over the last um, 40 years or so, uh, including the Phoenician inscriptions from later on, um, 8th and 7th century, when the Phoenicians are supposed to have settled the island. Although, again, these uh, sacred wells to the goddess Tanit, who is the consort of Baal Haman, and the Tophet from Taros, predate the um, official settlement by the Phoenicians by, by hundreds, if not a thousand years or more. Mm -hmm. um, they, they believe that Taros was actually the site of the Tarshish mentioned in the Bible, where King Solomon and King Hiram of Tyre, again, a Phoenician settlement that sent colonists out mm -hmm. uh, to the rest of the Mediterranean around the time of Ahab and Jezebel. Um, th that was where they built, the, the, they had this joint venture to send ships down from Ezion Geber, which is Elat today in Israel, through the Red Sea around Africa on a three-year voyage to Taros, which is a protected harbor on the west coast of Sardinia. There was mining on Sardinia, tin and lead. And uh, through their journey back and forth, they would collect fruit and uh, apes and uh, all spices and other things. Mm -hmm. And this three-year trip back and forth, and it made Tyre extremely wealthy. It also made Solomon extremely wealthy. So, uh, and there's good evidence to suggest that th that site, Taros, was the site. But Solomon had yoked himself in a business venture with a culture that was sacrificing its children 
Yeah, well, Solomon wasn't exactly, you know, a poster boy for following he the Lord's commands. He set up a high place for Molech. <laughs> yes, he did. And why, why other uh, faithful Jews who were faithful to Yahweh called the southern peak of the Mount of Olives the uh, Mount of uh, Abomination or something of that like something of that nature. Yeah, and speaking so, of the Mount of Olives, getting back to our Israel tour, yes. while we were standing on the Mount of Olives, you and I got to look at the Eastern Gate, which is bricked up, mm -hmm. which prophecy said it would be closed, waiting for the day when the Lord will walk through it. The Messiah will enter through the Eastern Gate. And that was the most, you know, if you didn't get to go with us this year to Israel, and if we get to go in the future, we highly recommend that if there's any way you can afford it, do go because, and if you don't go with us, go with somebody. Because standing on the Mount of Olives and looking at that gate and imagining where you are standing, mm -hmm. that the Lord himself will touch down. According to Zechariah 14. Yeah. According to Zechariah 14, that the Mount of Olives will split to the east and the west, and that he will, to the north and the south, I mean, right. and he will walk through that gate. Mm -hmm. That, I, I think that was one of the highlights of the entire trip for me, Yeah, uh, was there, there to, was to so, really connect with the Lord that way. Yeah, yeah, that, that was incredible. Uh, teaching on the, on the Southern Steps, uh, teaching at... Benias, the Grotto of Pan. That was incredible because, and that will be in the in the uh, the documentary, by the way, our travel log, because you got to teach and, and preach about Jesus' comments to his disciples, in yes. particular to Peter. Yeah. As you stood in front of that very grotto where he made that statement. And just before he, Peter, James, and John walked up Mount Hermon and then was transfigured into a being of light on what was supposed to be, according to the pagans. The, whole, the mountain holy to their chief, their creator, God, El, mm -hmm. his consort and their 70 sons. Yeah, that was that was incredible. We actually went up one of the slopes of Mount Hermon. Mike Heiser did a teaching there. Um, baptisms in the Jordan River. It was incredible. Dr. Heiser's teaching on why we baptize. Mm -hmm. That, I'd never heard that before. You mm -hmm. had heard it on his podcast before. Right. I'd never heard it. It was so right. Yeah. And suddenly everything makes sense. Right. Um, seeing the battlefield where David and, and, and Goliath met uh, yes. in, in battle. Yes, seeing it laid out before you, it, you, can, you can find these things on maps, you can look at diagrams, you can look at photographs, but until you are standing in that spot, yes. Yes. you don't get it. Yeah, so kudos to Aaron Lipkin and his team at Lipkin Tours made that and the Jordan extension incredible. Standing on Mount Nebo and looking across the Jordan River at mm -hmm. Jericho to see the plains of Jericho and where the Israelites gathered before the conquest. It was it was incredible to be where Jacob probably laid his head upon a rock and saw yes, the vision Bethel, of right. exactly to see Shiloh, that. Yeah. It was there were so many things on this and and I want to go back. Yeah, me too. But me I'm too. glad to be home. <laughs> Amen to that. There's something about sleeping in your own bed. And you know, Hearing your dachshund snore. Hearing your dachshund yeah. snore in the morning, waking up to that instead. Well, I liked waking up to the birds over there, but snoring dachshund can't be that Can't priceless. be that. And, of course, being there on the 70th anniversary of Israel's independence. And, by the way, we will end this with a, a little bit of video, if we've got time, that shows how they were celebrating there in Israel because they were very, very happy that the embassy was being moved there. And I'm looking at the time, and I bet we don't have time for that. Rats. <laughs> we'll show a little bit of clip. But anyway, have a blessed weekend. Thank you for watching as we keep watch. With Sharon Gilbert, I'm Derek Gilbert. And this is Sci Friday from Skywatch TV.